Right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody in the at the meeting uh, of the Plans Committee, the 12th of January. Good morning to those who may be watching on the courage and the um, the first item on the agenda today is apologies, perhaps. Yes, Chair. Apologies, Councillor Locke, Councillor Watson, Councillor Pennington substituting, Councillor Wiseman, Councillor Bushby substituting. Thank you, Sandra. At item two on the agenda are the minutes of the meeting held on the 1st of December on pages 5 to 16. And I'll move those from the chair. Sure. Could I just raise page six and the other applications? I'm not listed as been at the virtual site visits, but I did go on to the site visits to look at them prior to the meeting. I wonder if it could be recorded, please. Yeah, I can you record that, Sandra, that Councillor yeah. Pennington did yeah. see the yeah, virtual site visits. I'll second your motion to pass the rest of the chair. Thank you, Councillor Pennington. Uh, can we vote on those minutes, please? Sorry, I'm rushing this out. Councillor Bowton, not here yet. No. Councillor Brown. Four. Councillor Bushby. Same. Councillor Christie. Four. Councillor Craigie. Four. Councillor Leather. Four. Councillor McGough. Four. Councillor Pennington. Four. That's six, four, and one abstention, Chair. Thank you. Item three on the agenda is declarations of interest. Um, I know everybody knows this off by heart now, but for those in the room who are visiting us this morning, and for those on YouTube, members with interest to declare should refer to the agenda item and describe the nature of their interest when the item is being considered. Elected members of Devon County Council and Town and Parish Councils who've considered a planning application by virtue of their membership of that council hold a personal interest and are deemed to have considered the application separately. And the expressed views of that council do not bind the members concerned who consider the application afresh. And I always say it's at this meeting where we get all the latest updates and information on applications, which not necessarily to the town and parish councils. Uh, Okay, item four is agreements of agenda between parts one and two. There is no part two. Item five are urgent matters. I don't know what urgent matters, Heather, maybe? No. Item six is public participation. And I shall have to go back in a minute for introductions on this next page. Uh, public participation, we've had prior requests to speak uh, for the first item, which is on for the little old lady, but um, there's a letter to be read out from the applicant, Tim Hooper. For West Villa Chillsworthy on the first application, we've Robert Hort, who's speaking against, who's speaking on behalf of the parish council, or his parish council. We've also got Richard Ains. Ainsley against a member of the public. We've got Ben Harris, who's a supporter, who's the applicant for speaking. Uh, and we've also got Councillor Heppel, who's the ward member who called the application in for speaking. And on the second application at West uh, Villa, Chillsworthy, again, uh, we've got Robert Hoare speaking against, who's a parish councillor. Uh, Richard Ainsley, again, a member of the public, speaking against that. Uh, ben Harris, the applicant, speaking in support. And again, Councillor Heppel's here, the Speaker's Award member. It's expected that all who attend the Plans Committee that they'll give a fair and an in un uninterrupted hearing to the Planning Officer, giving their report, and to all those listed to speak and to the planning committee members when they begin their considerations. After all, it's only common courtesy. Thank you. And the order of speakers is as follows. The planning officer will give their presentation of the application, and then any town or parish council representative who wishes to speak 
four against the application have three minutes. And then two members of the public uh, who want to speak against the application, they have three minutes each. And then two members of the public in support of an application, they have three minutes each. And then at the end, any Tories district council member from the ward in which the application falls. Now, there's no time limit on that ward member, but we like them to be reasonably brief. And then after that, the Plans Committee then uh, debate the application with, with any questions they may have for the appropriate officer. Right, so we'll move on then to item seven. Well, before that, I'll do what I should have done at the start, which is get the committee and the officers present to introduce themselves. I'll start off with myself, Councillor Chris Leather, and I represent Northern, and then I'll move over to Councillor Doug Prishby. I'm the chair of college, but I'm here uh, representing um, Councillor White. And your award is Biddeford Northern. Good morning, my name is Peter Christie. I represent Biddeford North as well. Philip Pennington, Monkley, and Littlem, the Monkley and Putford, the only rural member on the planning committee today. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ruth Craigie. I represent Biddeford East. Uh, I'm Margaret Brown. I represent Great Charlington. Good morning. My name is Dermot Goff. I represent Biddeford North. Okay. Uh, and on my left, then, we've got our planning manager. Yeah, I'm Helen Smith, planning manager. Uh, Stacey Dory, head of legal and governance. Good morning. Matthew Millichurk, environmental protection officer. Good morning. My name is Sarah Boyle, and I'm the development management team leader. And the two most important ones who keep everything running. Kirsty Brown, Democratic Services Officer. Good morning, Sandra, Democratic Services Officer. Thank you. Okay. Right now we can get on with the actual applications. The first one this morning is 7A, and then um, Sarah will take Sarah will follow will take this application. Thank you, Chair. So yes, the application 0845. 2022 is for the erection of an ancillary annex at 120 Clavelli Road, Biddyford. So this was subject to a virtual site visit, and um, I'll run through the slides now for you. So this is just to show the location of the site. So as I said, it's on 120 Clavelli Road in the rear garden. It is in the development boundary of Biddyford. Um, it is surrounded by residential dwellings and the kind of north east and south and then to the west immediately there is a car park that's already there Next slide. this is just to show a brief kind of existing site plan of the site so that kind of entails the 120 Clavelli road the next door neighbor which is 121 and then montague place to the north it's just a satellite image um, of the the site um, so you can see the car park there to the west of Montague Place, and then the house fronts onto 120 Clavelli Road, and the garden is in behind. So this is just some pictures. Um, so this is the entrance um, looking at 120 Clavelli Road, um, kind of on the side there, and you're looking up Clavelli Road on this application site. <laughs> And then this is looking down. So this is coming out of um, Montague Place, coming, um, looking to the left there. Next slide. So this is looking from a top window of 120 Clavelli Road. So this is primarily the neighbouring property of 119. Next slide. And then this is 120 Clavelli Road's garden with the outbuilding that's already on site, um, kind of in the back of that photo. And then this is looking towards 121, and then obviously you can see the dwellings of Montague Place there. So this is at the back of 120 Clavelli Road, just to show the change in land. So as you come out, this is looking towards the garden of the neighboring property. And then this is looking um, straight up to the kind of garden. So you do have to go up steps to get to the, the top part of the garden. And then this is looking towards the neighboring um, dwelling, which is 121 um, kind of from the back of the, the dwelling itself. 
So this is just looking back towards 120 Clavelli Road. So 120 is the, the white dwelling in the middle. And then obviously you've got 121 to the left and then 119 to the right. This is standing on the, the garden itself. So this is looking towards Montague Place. Um, the fence obviously is about a metre high. They can obviously go up to 200 if they wish. So this is in the garden of 120, obviously looking at the garden of 121 um, and Montague Place then beyond that. So this is just further up to where um, roughly the, the building will be associated, um, which is being proposed. So this building is on site and obviously this just gave reference, which I mentioned in the site visit yesterday in terms of height. So this um, building is 2.4 metres, um, which was measured. And then obviously if there is any questions, but on the site visit it was explained, they are going down 0.8 metres. Um, just to kind of get a guideline of, of the height. So this is um, looking from the car park to the west. So the application site um, is well screened, um, looking from the west kind of back onto the, the rear gardens of 120 Clavelli Road. So this is from that car park kind of looking down Montague Place just to show the distance between obviously Montague Place and the, the wall, and then obviously 120 Cavelli Road is then set back further. So this is from Montague Place looking up at the building um, of what you can see kind of directly from it at the moment. And then this is just looking further down um, Montague Place, looking back towards, towards the building in that garden. This is just from the entrance of Montague Place, looking um, down the street. Um, and from this angle, obviously, the building is um, screened. So just going on to the proposed site plan, they are proposing uh, new access and parking to obviously alleviate the parking on Clavelli Road. And then it is a detached annex. Um, so just to clarify, that is why it was advertised as a departure. Um, so it is two bedrooms. It has been designed for the intended occupier, which we have received justification as stated in the report. These are the proposed elevations. So the main windows and doors are facing one onto the shared garden, which will be shared with 120 Valley Road. And then the window is facing towards um, where the car park is. And this is just the proposed floor plan, just to show in more detail of what they're proposing. Um, so it's two bedrooms with then an open sitting and kitchen um, and then a bathroom. So the main plan considerations with this application are the principle of development. The report goes into justification behind it being detached and not attached as per the policy. The impact on character and appearance impact on residential amenities. Objection comments were received for the applications. These have been discussed within the report. Highways, Devon County Highways did detail that it should be dealt with understanding advice. Ecology, other matters with regards to environmental protection. And therefore the conclusion is to recommend a resolution of approval. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Right, well, there's just one contribution, which is uh, a letter to be read out by the planning manager. And this is from Tim Hooper, the applicant. My name is Tim Hooper, and I've lived at 120 Clavelli Road for the past 26 years with my eldest son, Andrew, and my disabled son, Matthew. For 15 of those years, my wife was Matthew's full-time carer before she was diagnosed with dementia in 2012 and was moved to ET Care Home. I then became his full-time carer. In 2011, Andrew's fiance Amy, moved into the property where she helps me out with Matthew's daily needs. Matthew finds it difficult to walk on uneven surfaces and even the stairs. The annex will be on one level with a ramp leading to the front door for easy access. 
the annex is for me and Matthew to move into and then Amy and Andrew can live in the main property and that means they will still be close enough to help with Matthew's needs. The annex will have a big enough driveway so his daycare supporters can drive straight up to the property and drop him off right at the front door and with ease turn around. There has been many incidents out on Clovelly Road where Matthew becomes agitated and refuses to get out of the car. This will help massively. The annex will have a wet room located close to Matthew's bedroom so it's easy and safe to give him personal care. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Helen. Right, well, that's um, that's the left, last of the public contributions. Councillor Chris. Yeah, I think Councillor Bushby and I do all hat it on this one. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Right, who would like to start the debate on this? I noticed really good town council recommended approval on it. Councillor Bushby. Thank you, Chair. It's only a couple of minor points, but um, maybe uh, important. Um, on page 18 of the consulty representations, um, it says that uh, resolved that the application is approved on the proviso that the annex is tied with this existing property in order that it cannot be sold as a separate dwelling. And the word sold is important now. And then over on page 20, third paragraph down, um, partly down the paragraph says the town council have requested that a condition is attached to ensure the annex is tied to the host dwelling and therefore cannot be used. Now, I know it's only a play on words, but used and sold are, you know, two obviously uh, different phrases there. If it, if it cannot be used, I read that as if anything happened to the existing, you know, the proposed tenant, that building would be effectively empty because no one else could use it other than, you know, this person. Now, if you look at the conditions, condition four, attached at the end of the recommendation. The accommodation hereby permitted shall be used solely as an annex, ancillary to the existing dwelling known as 120 Clavelli Road, sharing the access parking and external amenity space of that dwelling and not as an independent dwelling. So it is, it's ancillary to 120 Clavelli Road. Okay. Can, whoever's living in 120, Stay in there, can use this as well. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Anybody else with any comments on it? Uh, Councillor Pennington. Thank you, Chair. Just a couple of uh, queries. Um, I gather it's 0.8 of a meter drop down on the ground level for the development of the annex. Yeah. Um, how are they going to get into multiple place? to get lorries there and how can that be done with the agreement of neighbours? I know you've got a condition in there about the working hours, but as the center of Montague Place is, you're going to be in a situation where a lorry may fall in, somebody may want to get to work. I wonder if there's possible to put a condition there that it's the lorries come in with the agreement of neighboring properties. Yeah, I don't think you can condition that because they've got Helen and tell me yeah. that. I, um, Councillor Pennington, I, I I think that would be very difficult to enforce. I okay. think it would it would be unreasonable to expect that that level of arrangement. There there is obviously condition three, which has been recommended by the Environmental Protection Officer, which restricts hours of construction works, and that includes deliveries. Um, one one would hope if there was any any conflict with somebody needing to get out yeah. that you, you would hope that people would, would yeah, talk and resolve that but I, I don't feel it's something we could add in the condition and my second point if i may chair any lighting between the main house and the sort of court annex because there is quite a distance between the two but i would assume that it'll be operated as one property in theory is there any need for safety lighting between the two properties so yeah i probably wouldn't say so obviously the annex that's why they have introduced obviously the um access as it is because the main intended occupier can't go up from the stairs from into the garden so that's why they've obviously one created the access to alleviate kind of highways but also to give them safe access in there um the path is 
obviously I've walked that path. It is the kind of a normal garden path. Um, it looks probably further than it is on the site plan, so I don't think there would need to be any kind of external lighting um, between the two. They will be used as one. Okay, thank yeah. you, Chair. Um, as long as we've been on planning a long time, Councillor Christie certainly will remember that Montague Place, that, that small park that was constructed there that just Helen's just passed. Uh, used to be a, a piece of land that Tories District Council owned, and we gave planning permission for it to be made into a car park. I think the residents have all contributed it in multiple place towards that. So, how it used to be there with traffic park, it used to be terrible in Montague Place. And obviously, construction traffic used there when they built and they had to excavate a great deal of the land there to get down to that level for the car park. So I, I honestly don't think for this development, the construction traffic is going to cause a big problem. Um, but like with any site, you've got to be a bit patient when things are being moved in and out of the, the development site. Well, unless anybody else, Mark, Councillor Brown. Sorry, Jack. Um, it is against GM25. Yeah. Um, and uh, although I have some sympathy, with the people that want to um, build the annex. I do worry where we're going with this. Why do we make policy if we're going to go against, against them like that? So I'm going to have to do some thinking about voting for this chair. Yeah, my personal view is we should, when this plan was developed, when the Torridge and North Devon plan was developed, they made, in my view, my personal view, they made a mistake by insisting that annex and had to be attached. If it's close by, there's no reason why you shouldn't have an annex. But that, that's just my personal view. It is against the current policy, as you say. But of course, material considerations have to be taken into account with applications. And this is, in my view, and I'm going to move approval of it, that um, there are material considerations that give us that uh, comfort if we go against that policy. I'd like to second that, please. Thank you, Councillor Bushman. Okay. Anybody else want to comment on this one? Okay, it's been moved to approve by my. I moved it for approval, Councillor Bushby. Secondly, can you take the vote, please? Thank you, Chair. Councillor Brown. Okay. Councillor Bushby. Or Councillor Christie. Or Councillor Craigie. Or Councillor Leather. Or Councillor McGough. Or Councillor Pennington. Or that's six for the motion and one against, Chair. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Sarah. Right, we move on to our second application this morning, which is on pages 24 to 36 of your agenda. Welcome, Councillor Gordon. Sorry about that. Sorry. Nice to see you. Uh, and James Jackson will present this one. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. Okay, as the chair said, this is an application reference one slash zero eight oh one slash twenty twenty two slash FUL, proposal is the erection of eight panels, an office and dog grooming salon and eight foot safety fencing. It's a resubmission of uh, a former application that was refused in May twenty two under delegated powers. Uh, it was refused due to the proximity of the panels to third party dwellings and the subsequent potential for significant harm to residential amenity. Uh, from the sound of, of dogs barking. The site is at West Villa in Chilsworthy. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, it's located in the countryside, but it is well related to the village of Chilsworthy. It's approximately 80 metres from the Chilsworthy development boundary. This is the site location plan here. There's three distinct parts of the site, which are shown in red. The northern part there is a proposed area for the dog exercise area. It's currently the corner of a field, which is a, a grass field. And down in the um, that southeastern parcel is the uh, kennels building, which is currently a vegetable patch, which is used by the applicants. 
and that western parcel over by the highway is uh, proposed to a car parking area, again, currently a grass area. The existing access to the public highway is also over on, on the western side. The blue, lay, blue line here obviously um, indicates the, the extent of the applicant's ownership as well there. Uh, in the southwest corner of, of the blue line, you can see the applicant's dwelling and annex and some former agricultural buildings, which are now in a poor state of repair. And also, uh, committee may re remember the existing um, mobile home, which was previously committed, uh, permitted by committee, which is shown there, just against the blue line on, on the southern boundary there as well. Um, something that's not shown on this plan is two recently constructed detached dwellings where um, you can probably see there, thank you, Helen, where, Fair, where there was Fairhaven art, there are two dwellings there now. Uh, they're not shown because it's uh, simply because they're recently constructed and the ordnance survey data has not been updated, but they are shown on, um, on, on plans within um, the submission, which I'll come into Montu shortly. Um, there's other third party dwellings as well, um, which are over to uh, on the other side of the public highway over to the to the west and also down to the, the southeast of the sites as well. There's also some recently constructed dwellings there, which you can see, which are over to the east, which is um, which is uh, relates to Kerno House. And then the main part of um, Chills Lillian, so the main built form is over to the east and to the south as well. Uh, Chillsworth is designated as a village in the local plan uh, and it's slightly repelling. Here's just a couple of aerial images showing, showing what we've just described effectively on the left hand side. We've got uh, the, the site there sort of as a close up image. That northern star is the proposed location for the dog exercise area. The, and then the two southern stars are the um, proposed kennels location and also for the car park. And then on the right hand side is just an aerial image there that just shows the site's relationship to Oldworthy within the wider context. And again, the red star um, denotes the, the site. Next slide, please. That's just the existing site plan, which just shows the existing uh, situation on the ground. Next slide, please. And then we can see the um, proposed site plan here. Also, you can see the two recently constructed dwellings are shown um, on that site plan. And the submission annotates the distances effectively between um, the various parts of the development and the uh, third party dwellings. So we can see here that the, um, the dwelling over to the west is shown as 105 metres from the proposed exercise area and 120 metres from the kennels. The new dwellings to the south are shown as 96.4 metres for the kennels. And uh, the other dwelling to the south is shown as 102 metres um, separation between that and the kennels. Uh, the dwellings over to the um, east of the exercise area, there's obviously a significant distance there as well between um, the exercise area and those dwellings. Uh, also shown is a parking area that shows uh, provision for eight car parking spaces with some landscaping as well. Um, and that shows the kennels building as well, which is purpose built by a company in Malvern. Uh, the kennels building would be enclosed by a fence and a hedge bank on its southern and western sides, and on its northern and eastern sides would be enclosed by existing uh, mature hedgerows. There's also a soakway and a septic tank and a drainage field to deal with surface water and um, foul water. And uh, the exercise area there is shown up in the northern part. That's a 30 by 30 meter um, grass area. Um, there is a suggestive condition as well to for that to be enclosed by a post and rail fence, should members be um, minded to, to uh, grant planning permission. Uh, next slide, please. On the left hand side here, we have a proposed kennel building, eight kennels, which would provide for a maximum of 16 dogs. Constructed, constructed of a UPVC frame with glazing and poor safe mesh. Uh, in terms of its size, it's approximately 12 by 10 meters in terms of its footprint. And uh, on the right hand side, that shows that proposed building in the context of uh, the fencing and also the hedge banks that are proposed. So you can see from that, that drawing that, that, that effectively the top of the building would be, um, would be uh, visible there, but the majority of it would be screened. There's another condition recommended as well in terms of to ensure that those hedge banks come forward before the kennels build is brought into use. And that's just considered um, prudent, really, in terms of the character and appearance of the area. Next slide, please. 
This is the proposed floor plans. This shows out the shows the layout of the kennels building. Um, as I said previously, it's eight kennels, um, which could accommodate a maximum of 16 dogs. And in the bottom right hand corner, there is the office and the grooming area um, in the corner there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just a few photographs here. On the left, we have the proposed site for the kennels. As you can see, that's currently um, in use as a, as a domestic um, vegetable patch. And then on the right is looking south from the kennels area. So you can see the applicant dwelling on the right hand side and it's annexed the um, mobile home that was previously committed by the committee. And then a fence behind that and trees. And then beyond that are the two dwellings that were recently constructed. And over on the left, um, also existing third party dwellings as well. Next slide, please. Uh, this shows on the left the proposed exercise area. This is just looking into that exercise area from the north. As you can see, it's the corner of a field, which is currently um, a grassed area. And on the right hand side, this is looking east from the um, dog exercise area towards the recently constructed dwellings at Kurnow House. <clears throat> Next slide, please. The left-hand photograph shows the proposed car parking area with the access um, beyond that. And the right-hand photograph just shows the access there, which is looking into the site. Uh, next slide, please. And the material considerations in this case are principle of development, character appearance, highways, residential amenity, biodiversity, and foul and surface water drainage. Um, as set out in your officer's report, um, officers do consider that the principle of development is established and supported by policy DM14, which offers uh, in principle small support for small scale economic development when it's well related to defined settlements such as Chillsworthy. And that is subject to um, considerations relating to amenity, highways and character impact. As I said um, at the start, De under delegated powers, a previous application was refused in May last year due to that impact. Um, and now that is still a key consideration for members to consider today in terms of the impact on third party dwellings. Um, the, there's obviously a, a, a number of objections that have cited that as, as a concern, and, and that's understood. Um, the Environmental Protection Officer has been consulted and has confirmed that he has no objection to the proposals, and that's on the basis now of the increased uh, separation distances between the kennels and the dog exercise area and to the third party dwellings mm -hmm. and uh, also set out within the officer's report is the details of the noise management plan which has been submitted and that sort of goes into significant um, detail really about measures that will be uh, employed to uh, mitigate any noise impacts um, to an acceptable level and that's in terms of the building design itself, which is uh, designed by um, a specialist company called Pedigree Pens, which are based in Malvern. And there's a condition um, there to require that to come forward in terms of that specification of that building. Uh, there's also other measures in terms of no access to the kennels for any visitors, uh, restrictions on drop off and collection times between eight and eight. Uh, people can only arrive at the site by um, appointment only and, and can't just turn up. Uh, there's, in terms of the exercise area, only one dog or, or two dogs from the same family will be exercised at, at one time to limit any noise there. And um, also there's, within the design of the building, there's sound absorbing ceiling panels and also triple ventilation, um, which should uh, ensure that windows don't have to be open all the time. If they do have to be open, then there's very small windows that are towards the top of the building. Um, and uh, as, as sort of set out by the environmental protection officer, really, that, that management plan does sort of set out robust measures to, to ensure that, that the any harm would be um, restricted to acceptable levels, really. So, um, that has led to a, a recommendation really that, that the application should be approved um, on the basis that the uh, any immunity harm can be controlled within acceptable levels and that the application is acceptable in all other respects. So it is recommended for approval um, subject to the conditions set out on pages 34 and 35 of your agenda. Thank you. Thank you, James. <clears throat> right, our first contribution is from Robert Hoare. Speaking against it, uh, Irish councillor. And uh, once you're settled, you've got three minutes to yeah, thank you. address the committee. Thank you. 
Well, good morning, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for letting me address your uh, committee. I'm speaking on behalf of Holsworthy Hamlet's uh, Parish Council and Chilsworthy residents to oppose this planning application. West Villa is described as being on the outskirts of Chilsworthy Village, but recent planning approvals for, a for residential property, some of it outside the local plan, means that West Villa is now bounded by residential homes, 12 recently built and outline approval for a further six. The committee report map is misleading as it doesn't show all these properties, and it would have you believe the site is more open than is the reality, although obviously James has shown you uh, uh, a more current map. Parish Council's main concern is the noise and light pollution that dog kennels will inflict on residents who will have little recourse to address the issues. Despite the noise studies carried out, no study will ever mitigate dogs barking in an open run and the disturbance to residents. In the committee report, we note the conditions attached to the recommended approval. However, this will do nothing to appease residents as they are aware of there is little capacity to check or enforce these conditions. The case in point being the retrospective planning approval given for a static caravan at West Villa some 10 months ago where the conditions have not been met. This committee will also be aware of the hundreds of enforcement orders outstanding within Porridge. Light pollution is noted as a prime consideration for any new development. How will this be regulated for a kennel in the middle of a plot where 24 hour access will be required? It seems a conflicting conundrum and impossible to regulate, but will be all too obvious to the residential properties surrounding West Villa. The planning application is supported by a business plan that states in addition to dog breeding, they will now take mature dogs who have the capacity to increase the noise generated, especially excited animals in a strange environment. Who's going to regulate that only two dogs will be allowed in the free running area at any one time? And what action will Torridge take when this condition is broken? The committee report makes note of the business opportunity to the area, but the business is already up and running. The business plan makes no provision for local employment opportunity. And as there is none, this is a contradictory planning statement. The first planning application for these kennels was, has been refused. In this application, the reciting of the kennels within the plot is merely smoke and mirrors. But the residential properties will be subject to the same noise and light pollution. Clearly, there were strong enough grounds to refuse the application, and nothing has changed with this application other than to make it more objectionable with uh, mature dogs on site and the potential of an animal crematorium. Please acknowledge the loss of quality of life that we've placed on residents adjacent to West Villa, and whom will have little, sorry, whom will have to live with an unacceptable business growth that has no right to be in a village setting. We requested to refuse this application. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew. What an idea. Our, our next speaker is in support of the application, Ben Harris, who's the applicant. If you'd like to come up, speak right into the end of that microphone, please. It picks you up better then. And once you settle, you've got the be to address the committee as well. Thank you. That's lovely. Thank you. Okay, so currently we are a five star licensed business, um, licensed by Torridge Council for uh, breeding. Um, we're simply wanting to upgrade our facilities to improve the welfare and efficiency within the business. Um, these are high specification kennels to create a home atmosphere similar to a conservatory constructed with UPVC, double glazing and high quality soundproofing. At the moment, um, the dogs are located at the main house. So to put the kennels in, they would actually be further away to any other dwellings that, that are close to the area. Um, in six years of running the business at the address, we've never had a complaint in person or via the council. Um, and all our immediate neighbours have stated in their objections how wonderful and tranquil the village actually is. But the business is already running, um, so we know we're not causing that much of a nuisance as it is. Um, yeah, and they're just concerned with what noise a kennel business might bring to the area, but in fact, We've been running the business there for six years, um, and it's it's only a small amount of residents that have objected. Um, and we're outside of the development area uh, for Chillsworthy as well, so we're not actually in the village, um, and we're just simply looking to upgrade the facilities to make the business better. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Harris. <clears throat> And finally, uh, to address the committee is Ward Member Councillor Hemp. Uh, 
thank you, Chair. And um, I call this planning application in, and I stand before you as ward member for uh, Milton and Tamar Tamar's Island, within which um, Chillsworth is located. Um, my stated reasons for calling this application remain valid, and these are set out in the officer's report. Um, I think uh, James uh, did uh, has modified the plan that was attached to the front piece of the uh, officer's report, but it, it still doesn't show that. Uh, is it possible that I can illustrate on the plan on the swing? And which, is that one? No, it's no. The, that one. That one. Is it better if I use that so the committee members can see it, or that one so that? Well, they can. They're the, the same. They're the same. Okay. They see the same. Yeah. Right. Plan. Um, so we have um, here the two new plannings. Um, what is not shown? Sure. There's no chance the members can see. It's probably better. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So James has indicated that um, this is now um, planning consent was granted on West Villa land. For some unknown reason, that does not appear in the relevant history. Uh, why, I don't know. Um, but the relevant history, the site has a relevant history, a long relevant history, and these two dwellings um, do not figure in that. But this area here, this is a new house, Brayside. This area here also has planning consent for six dwellings and the whole of that section there makes up the six dwellings. So this area links through. So West Villa is not in the countryside. West Villa is the Western end of Chillsworthy village. And I, you know, I, this is fundamental. That is not divorced. So in, in regards to the principle of development, the fundamental question here is, is West Villa in the countryside location or is it now integrally part of Chillsworthy Village? My view is that because of the two new dwellings that have been built on land that was part of West Villa and the um, allocation of housing on land between West Park and the new house Brayside, recently constructed to the west of Meadowside, West Villa is now linked directly to and forms western boundary of the built environment that is the rural village of Chillsworthy. It has been noted by committee members that the site plan will have done all that. Um, effectively, therefore, West Villa is an integral part of Chillsworthy village. This is such a fundamental planning issue that I feel it necessary to bring to the committee's attention an extract from the applicant's application in 2018 for the two dwellings, where the applicant's agents, GM planning, state in their planning statement the guidance within paragraph 55 of the NPPF, and I quote, goes on to suggest that isolated homes in the countryside should be avoided. The proposed development cannot be said to be isolated as it is proposed to be sited within the village, surrounded by other housing. They go on to state, my client's land at West Villa is a long established part of the village, visually and physically, and is surrounded by two dwellings on two sides. The site is therefore considered to be within the village and subject to policy DVT2. It would appear now that the success of this current application relies on the complete opposite argument. ST07 relates to spatial development strategy in the countryside beyond villages. <coughs> ST11 states that the proposals for economic development would be supported where they do not conflict with other local plan policies. Well, surely NDL, NDTLP includes policies designed to protect development in inappropriate locations and in particular protect rural village settlements and amenities. DM14 provides in principle support for small scale economic development in the countryside. The key question here is whether the site really is in a countryside location and beyond the village of Chillsworthy, because if, as I believe to be the case, it is now properly within, not now properly within a countryside location, then planning policies ST07, ST11, and DM14 are not applicable 
and therefore the application should be refused. Um, I would just say here, I am going a little bit longer than I should want to do, but this is linked to the next application and I won't repeat myself. Um, on the question of character and appearance, the issue here is not so much to do with appearance as a significant ad adverse effect the development would have on the character of the area. The peaceful and tranquil rural village environment, which I'm sure is the very reason why the very vast majority of Chillsworthy residents chose to live here in the first place. Um, I did a brief search of existing commercial dog kennels in the Devon area, and these were in excess of 40. And all of these, the ones that I looked at, all appeared to be in a remote rural or farm location and well away from established villages or residential amenities. And in terms of residential amenity, as the officer's report states right at the beginning of this report, policy DM01 of the N, uh, NDTLP confirms that development will be supported where it would not harm the amenities of neighbouring properties. With proposed commercial dog kennels located within less than 100 yards of neighbouring properties, I would argue that it cannot fail to have a harmful effect on the amenities of these neighbouring properties. It must be appreciated that noise from dogs here would not come just from the kennels and exercise area, but more likely each time dogs are delivered to and collected from the site, which would be out in the open and uh, without any acoustically controlled built kennels. I'm afraid I just cannot accept the findings of the applicants instructed sound experts, and I'm surprised that the Tories District Council and Environmental Protection Officer has concluded that any resultant, and I quote, any resultant harm to residential properties immediately would not be significant. I know for a fact that the residents of neighbouring properties vehemently disagree, and even the threat of commercial dog kennels being located so close to their properties is already causing them severe stress and anxiety. Um, all of you sitting on this committee represent the well-being of residents within your own ward, and I would urge you to consider how you would view such a development proposal so close to residential properties in your own ward. I, on behalf of a number of Chillsworthy residents, say that if considered, if consented, the proposed development would have a significant adverse impact on the amenities currently enjoyed by the residents of neighbouring properties and new properties to be built, and consequently contrary to DM01. Conclusion. For the reasons I've given, I can't agree with the case officer when he states that the principle of development is considered acceptable. That was a quote nor with his statement that the reciting of the kennels and exercise area from where they were when the last application re re was refused would ensure that residential amenity within this area will be adequately safeguarded. On behalf of concerned local nearby residents and the new residents of houses yet to be built, I would say that the principle of the proposed development here is not acceptable in this village location and that the proposed reciting of the kennels and exercise yard will not in any way safeguard local residential amenity. In his conclusion, the case officer notes that no noise-related complaints have been received in respect of the existing dog breeding business at the site. But please note that there is a huge difference between a, a, between a small business where apparently two dogs are used for breeding and are housed in the house that is West Villa to a commercial business with outdoor kennels for 16 up to 16 boarding dogs together with outdoor exercise area. Fundamentally, though, it is my contention that this site is not now legitimately in a countryside location, but realistically, it is in a village location. This view has been in, even been endorsed by the applicant's own planning consultants in their statement relating to application 1 forward slash 0680 in 2018. Consequently, I would request that this application be refused as it is contrary to policies ST07, ST11, DM01, and DM14 of the NDTLP. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hatton. <clears throat> Before I brought Councillor Hatton in, I uh, made a mistake. Thank you, Helen, for pointing that out. We've got a speaker from the public against this application. I don't know, I missed that. It's on my list. Richard Ainsley. Thank you. I sorry, sorry to have gone out of the order we know you do. But if you'd like to get a second and again speak right into the end of that microphone, it picks your voice up there. And once you settle you for three minutes, we'll address the committee. Thank you. Thank you for having me. 
in here, yes. My main objection, I absolutely agree with everything that Councillor Heppel said, and I would appreciate taking firm note of that. My main objection is that it will create noise pollution, but noise pollution of a very particular and penetrating kind. Stressed dogs in company with others can both whine and bark and howl and yelp at an alarming 115 decibels. This may be heard up to 500 meters away. The nearest houses are, they say, 96 meters. Chillsworthy is a quiet residential village with many more houses than are shown on the application map, and they will be affected. We will be affected. I live closest to them. I must say also that the two houses recently constructed were granted permission and built by these same applicants. That needs to be clear. This is a resubmission of a, a previous application which was refused due to its impact on amenities. But little has changed. They are still dogs which will create an unacceptable adverse effect being within earshot. It is said that only two dogs at a time are to be exercised, but how is that to be enforced? Failures to enforce our legion. Now I quote directly from the delegated report. The environmental protection officer concludes that any resultant harm to residential amenity would not be significant. He continues, it is pertinent to note that DM01 refers to significant harm as opposed to just harm. So there you have it. Causing harm is acceptable, is it? Don't cause harm. Please refuse this application. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Andrews. Thank you. Right, that, that is the end of speakers to this application. So uh, we would like to start the ball rolling. Councillor Christian. Well, yeah, I, I wouldn't wish barking dogs on anyone because I, I go back to um, the problem we had at Welcome. I don't know if you any other recall it, where that kennel, the kennels there were a long way from anywhere, and yet we were inundated with complaints across a valley, the noise. But I, I have a problem with this one because I see the proposal, and when I saw it first, it said erection of eight kennels and a grooming salon. And I thought, oh, they're going to stay in there while they get groomed. Um, I then read what Paulsworthy Hamlets uh, said, their parish council. Councillors were informed that this application concerns an existing dog breeding business. Where the applicants would like to relocate to a different position, which is more central within their property. Rather than the creation of a new business, e.g., a boarding kennel business, as apparently some people have assumed. And when you read the actual application, there's nothing here about boarding kennels. Is this a boarding business? Or nowhere are they applying for a, a boarding kennels. It just says kennels. Um, it's very vague, and holds where the habits don't think it is a boarding kennels. Can you try and sort that out for me? Yes, yeah, certainly, Chancellor. Thank you, Chancellor. Yeah, it would be boarding kennels because that's that's the, na the, the nature of the business that they actually currently run is, is basically a dog breeding business, and they also do ancillary. Um, ancillary activities related to that such as microchipping as well and they also do carry out some small um, scale dog grooming as well and so this they do go hand in hand because the the kennels obviously are related to dogs and etc cetera, etc cetera. but the, the the kennels will be a boarding kennels facility it's not that the kennels are used particularly in conjunction with dog breeding necessarily because it's because it will be private clients that can obviously employ use those services and, and board their dogs within at these kennels so why doesn't the ban application say it's a dog boarding business? It doesn't say that. Well, I think it, it does say that it's obviously kennels. So well, yeah, <laughs> business, isn't it? Well, I, I just thought it would be implied by the kennels that it would be a, a boarding business, rather because if you think about the nature of dog breeding, then you don't necessarily need um, kennels for the dog breeding exclusively, would you? I would have thought. I don't know. I don't breed dogs. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, I think as well, Jack, can I can I clarify the planning position in terms of the countryside yeah. aspect? I think it's quite important yeah. to come back to that. Um, obviously, the, the ward members sort of set out his position in terms of the, the built form has, has, has come toward that site by virtue of the creation of um, or the construction of two dwellings. 
and now it doesn't consider that, that this is a countryside location. It, in planning terms, it is a matter of fact that this is that this site is in the countryside. It's outside of the development boundary. It may be in the future, in terms of a, a local plan review or something like that, that the development boundary would be redrawn to take into account um, uh, recently constructed development in terms of those two zones. But as we stand now, the, the site is in the countryside, basically outside of the development boundary for um, for chills, really. And so, and so that 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 obviously does influence the policy context in terms of STO7 being a countryside location um, and also DM14 in terms of being um, within the rural area and, and supporting local um, small scale economic development. And I think the other policy point just to point out is that, as, as um, Mr. Arrington pointed out, one of the, the speakers, is that po policy DM01, which seeks to protect residential immunity, does refer to significant harm rather than just harm. So that, that really is the test of whether that impact would be acceptable or not, is whether that, that reaches the bar of significance or not. And so from an officer's point of view, that, that bar has not been reached, and so the proposal does, does accord with the M01. But that is really the key consideration. I think I, I didn't say when I finished the presentation, but Matthew Millichamp is here, the Environmental Protection Officer, and I think if if members did have any queries about the, the noise impact from a more technical perspective, then he's obviously available to answer any questions that you may have as well. Thank you, James. Well, well I, I mean, oh, Councillor Pennington. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, go back to the, no the noise is obviously the issue here and of the, the contention. Um, I, I, I've been aware of dog kennels in various parts of the around. Uh, the urban areas of Biddyford and this has caused problems in the past. I want to ask a question about the refused application 10296 uh, was refused on the 17th of May 2022 and yet sound acoustics on page 35 and uh, condition 7 actually approved a situation on the 28th of February which was three months earlier. Now then they're approving something that Torridge is refusing. Is that correct? Is it, too, is, is it Torridge environmental officer that's raising the bar here? Or is this sound acoustics a company selling the equipment and then trying to prove um, that the equipment will keep sound down? Can, can you explain to me why these dates don't quite tie up? Yeah, of course, actually. Yeah, no problem. So Soundguard Acoustics are the um, noise consultants employed by the applicants, basically, and they prepared for the first application after this, a noise um, a noise assessment and also a noise management plan, basically, on that date, on the 28th of Feb. The issue with the first application was, although we did have the noise management plan, the kennels and the dog exercise area were considered far too close to existing dwellings. And so the noise management plan wouldn't have actually mitigated that harm because, because of the proximity, basically. So now that, that the kennels and the dog exercise area have been moved to, to locations as proposed, as shown here. And so now, with the, in the view of the Environmental Protection Officer, those, those actual measures set out in the management plan will be sufficient because of the, the distance involved. But my concern, Chair, um, uh, James, uh, is, is the situation that it's our Environmental Officer team that is setting the bar for the safety of neighbouring residents and not the consultant acoustics uh, company appointed to do the situation. I do have a concern here on that one. So I, it, it does rankle me in a bit uh, with that difficulty. Mm -hmm. The Absolutely. second question, as I may just go on briefly, Chair, is that on page 26, it says the site is located um, on the floodplain of zone one. Is zone one high risk or low risk? No, so zone one is the lowest risk. It's the lowest yes, risk. Yes, yeah. But that's slightly different to what you said on page 33. Oh, really? Apologies. If you don't put a zone in there at all, um, there's no zoning there at all. So zone. I see. Yeah. Zone one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Thank I, you very I, much indeed. On, in terms of your first, first point, Chair and, and Councillor, so would it be useful to, um, to, for Matt to explain sort of his position in terms of the, the noise impact at this stage? Yeah, yeah because yeah. Okay. I'm hoping that. Uh, Committee members have looked at the noise assessment put forward by the Sound Guard Acoustics. It's a very, very comprehensive document. I read it through yesterday afternoon and I printed off a couple of extra 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a specific question? At on the noise. On I mean, looking at the objections, it is down to what kind of noise will be generated from the site with the dogs either being exercised uh, or in the kennels. And looking at the location, which James has just said had been moved from the original application to these locations, and the hedging around and the other issues, the kennels themselves have got a very high level of sound attenuation built into them. Uh, the main issue is, does it satisfactorily address the concerns of the nearest residents? And you've got measurements, I've printed it off here, you've got measurements of the nearest properties there, and they're referred to by uh, sound guard acoustics as well. In fact, I think they've done that with those measurements. So any questions specifically to do with that? Councillor Christie. Yeah, can I just ask, um, because the noise, if there is noise from dogs, will be intermittent, what's the legal position on that? Because I've always understood it's where noise is fairly continuous that people can put in an official complaint and we have to do something about it. If it's intermittent like this, because obviously the number of dogs will vary, um, you know, all sorts of things. If somebody complained, would that have any official weight? Or Yes, it would under environmental legislation. Um, irrespective of it being intermittent or continuous, we, we could still investigate that as a, as a noise nuisance complaint. Absolutely, it wouldn't have to be. It wouldn't have to be intermittent to. Um, it wouldn't have to be continuous, rather, for us to substantiate or justify um, investigating that complaint. I only ask because I've had complaints where I think Torridge have been out, and the noise never ha actually happens when Torridge goes. Uh, it's a real catch twenty two. That, but... Yeah, I mean, certainly with statutory nuisance, it's it's not just the level of noise; it's the frequency and duration. So, you know, you're absolutely right. Officers would need to witness um, the the noise in question um, in, in determining whether a statutory nuisance exists. <clears throat> and uh, Soundguard actually had looked at the worst scenario with the kennels and the uh, exercise area. In their report, they've looked at the worst possible scenario to come up with the recommendation at the end that, that I printed off that the application should not be refused planning for reasons of noise impact. Whilst it's likely that barking noise will be heard within the environment, it's important to consider that environmental noise assessment is not a test of inaudibility and that, uh, and that context forms part of the assessment. It's considered that a dog barking within a rural environment is not out of context with that environment, especially the dogs are already present at the site. And I'm just minded of the dogs trust kennels out at West Down. Any of you been out there to those? You never hear any dogs there barking. And if kennels are properly constructed and looking at this, how it's proposed to be developed in my view, uh, I don't think there is, there is a problem. Dogs don't bark all the time. I mean, you, you go to the burrows any day. There are a lot of people exercise the dogs there. They're not all barking and yapping going on. In fact, you very rarely hear a dog barking on the burrows. So uh, to have this picture in one's mind that dogs are barking all the time, uh, and the, the kennels are eight kennels, could, could take 16. But you couldn't put two strange dogs together normally in a kennel. So most of them will only be single occupancy most of the time, I would imagine. But uh, thanks to McGough. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, this question to Mr. Minister, if it may. Um, yeah, we've got a lovely glossy document from Soundguard, or whoever they are, I don't know. Uh, where's the due diligence from Torridge? Because at the end of the day, we, we're representing Torridge residents here, and we need to be a, a clear, precise, view from Torridge, so then we don't get any legal challenges coming forward, because if, if we put something forward yourselves, where or you obviously the board member alluded to the other dwellings being built, just say along the front of the, front of the building, you know, front of the like lane side, of, as I've seen on the plans there. Where, where's Torridge's point from this? Because it's lovely that the applicants have gone, they spent this money on to the, they're working for them. We're working behalf of Torridge, so I'd just like to see our side of things. Yeah. This is, you know, should we get a form of base, you know, a sound decision that we're going to do today? So I agree with Councillor Pennington on this one here. 
It's not trying to catch you out, but um, we've represented other residents here as well. So you don't have to go back to each resident to tell them exactly why we've got this decision. Sure. Okay. Sorry, Councillor, could I just to clarify? So you were asking about the validity of, of this particular uh, acoustic consultant soundguard. Is is that just so I understand it properly? I don't want anything to do with soundguard. Okay. I'm asking you, Mr. Vito, our point exactly is to say 16 kennels going forward, 16 sure. logs. How have you come to your decision on the noise levels and what's the mitigation? You've come to to yep. leave it for pressures at the residents here today. Yeah, well, as, as, I'm, as I'm sure you and, and other members have um, read within the document, that there's no there's no standard for for, for measuring um, noise from from dog barking. There's just no standard out there at this moment in time. So you you have to look at other standards and guidance to reach a, a conclusion or, or um, you know, form, form an opinion. And certainly the guidance and standards that have been used within this noise report, this noise assessment, um, we, we would so, certainly concur with. Um, I think with regards, it's worth mentioning, with regards to the actual acoustic consultant in this respect, they've got a wealth of knowledge and experience, and we've actually dealt with them on another dog kennels um, site. So we have a great deal of confidence in what's been put forward here in this noise assessment. Jim, can I go back? Yeah, you, you're basing all, all the, at the moment, I, I, I plan to make a member. We're just going by exactly what sound I tell us. Then yeah. I, I, yeah, if you if you attack me this, sure. I'd have the utmost, utmost respect for you. Okay. I, I have no respect for anyone. I'm not, I'm not trying to demean you at all. No, no. It just where's Torres's view on this? And where's our paperwork, which actually backs this up? Yeah. So it just, it just takes a bit of, if, if I was living in so I have nothing to economic development. You know, fact, I'm all for it. The economic drive of the area rules. So I'm, I'm a full support of this. I, I support the, I think, turning from the old, um, what was it? That's caravan, I think, was the, as well at the time. I'm all for that. If they own the land, you should have that right to be able to live on the land and upgrade it. So I'm, I'm definitely all for that. I vote for yeah. the last time. But this one here, the main issues of noise and yes, how, how do we make it, mitigate this noise? And how does Torridge mitigate this noise? You can't just say, which you have, you know, oh, it doesn't. So I come to this criteria that where you can look at this, but we have, we have no report from Torridge. Councillor mm -hmm. McGough, just just one minute. Go on, Chair. The, the, the advice is, is here. I don't know if you've looked at Sandgar's report and read it, Chair. No, no, Chair. Just, 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 just let me. I'm not listening by an outside voice. I want Torridge. We are the planning authority. Just let me. Torridge. Just let me. No, I don't want to let you know. I don't want well, to let you know. Say. You know what, 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 I'm what? chairing this meeting, so chair, just let me tell you. Don't try and you twist have, my words around. I'm you have, the beginning. Listen to me. I'm not interested in saying God's thing. You get me interested in this this meeting, Councillor McGough. You are being what? very disruptive. Please, well, disruptive. please, just let me say, you've heard the, the view of our environmental officer the about view, the yeah. pot potential noise, and that's what we're talking about, potential noise from, from dogs on the site. If you looked at the layout of the site and where the kennels and where the dog exercise area will be and the conditions that are in the uh, recommendation to prove it, if you read all that, we've got to make our decision on what's before us. And part of the evidence put forward is this comprehensive report that I read through about possible what the issues may be. And as I said, Soundguard themselves looked at the worst case scenario when they were judging the possible. If you read about the construction of the kennel, how that's built, and the noise attenuation that's built into that, all that is in uh, documents that are online that people can read. So we've just got to look at, and yeah, most people in the area, the ones in the nearest properties, you've got the measurements of the distances, which I think are quite long distances in most respects. The talk of the six dwellings that may get built, that have got planning for it, they might not be built. That's nothing to do with this, to be honest. Whether they're built or not, nothing to do with this application. You've got to look at what's before us. It was turned down under officer delegation before because of the location of the proposed kennels and exercise area. Now it's been moved and this is what's before us and that's what we look at. And you can't just dismiss evidence that either an applicant or an objector puts forward, saying, I don't do anything to do with Sandgar. You cannot. That's too cavalier an attitude for somebody on the plans committee. 
you've got to consider what's in front of us and what's been put forward by supporters and objectors. So, Councillor McGough. Sorry, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Um, I didn't realise it was a Chris Lever show, not the Tories District Council show, but there you go. Um, go. Go back on the point, which I will address straight to you, Councillor Lever, as a chair of plans. I asked for Torres' report. With the Torres, so if the plan application comes through, Torres have to do no due diligence and so, right, any mitigation from our own experts here, we're just happy for another expert to come forward. This is where my concern is for members of the public. I'm trying to get clarity for the members of the public. Right, I'm going to be in here. Yeah, if, if I could just come in there, Councillor McGough. Um, so, as it has been explained, um, the application is supported by a technical document, which, as you rightly point out, Councillor McGough has been prepared on behalf of the applicant. Um, Mr. Millichope is um, a statutory consultee in the process. So as, as a planning team, as, as development management officers, we are not experts in um, noise, noise, the technical side of noise. So um, Mr. Millichope was consulted and you'll see on pages 28 and 29 of your reports, there are um, three responses from Mr. Millichope. Um, the first very detailed, and then two subsequent responses. Now, from a Torridge planning point of view, that is the information we get from our statutory consultee, which comments on the technical information provided. There isn't a detailed noise report that, that Mr. Millichope would have carried out. His role is to appraise what is submitted and um, advise us as the planning team, firstly, whether the methodology is accurate, whether the assumptions are accurate, and whether whether he as a professional environmental protection officer is satisfied by it. So I would say in terms of the comments and the position put forward, it is as you see on pages 28 and 29, but of course Mr, Mr. Millichoke can provide any further clarification today. Thank you, Helen. Councillor Christie. Yeah, um, just want to bring up a couple of points that you actually said. Um, the first one, dogs don't bark all the time. I have one in my ward. The bloke left at half past eight, the dog started barking, and he stopped when he came back half past five at night. I went round there and just listened to it. You could go around any time of the day and the dog was howling. But that sound guard report, I'm glad Councillor McGough brought it up because the last Bit you read out, it was fascinating. It said that uh, you should expect to hear dogs in the countryside, basically. This is the country. That argument was brought up with Corky the Copper at Hartland, but uh, didn't break, didn't count for anything there, did it? Right, anybody? Councillor Bush, be sorry. Yeah, you did have your hand up a while ago. Just, just briefly, Chair. Um, on page 27, it's, it says it is understood that a license would be required from Torres and Council for the proposed. Panels. Um, I understand that. Um, but, but under what circumstances would the license, could the license be revoked? Presumably it would, it would be noise based complaints. And the reason I say that is because you mentioned just now there's no standard to measure dog barking noise, which I find quite yeah, strange. Right. Hmm. For, so for the for the purpose of this assessment, that there's certainly no standards. Um, and the standard that has been applied in this scenario has been approved by ourselves. Um, with regard to your question on license, I'm not a license officer, but I believe welfare and and um issues such as dog barking nuisance um would warrant a, a license being revoked. Okay, yes. I mean there are. I think the license refers to the dog breeding part of the mm. of the business. At boarding kennels, I think, too, do need license. Well, we do monitor boarding kennels. I know that there's some in Buckley Brewing other than they get, but we do get modern. I think they're inspected every 12 months to see they're complying with health and welfare and all the rest of it. So as I say, um I've, I've looked at it in great detail, I'm sure you all have. Uh, I'm going to propose it. it. We go with the recommendation to grant because I think what's been laid out where the site in the middle that you see on the screen now and the hedge rows to be constructed, I, I think 
the mitigation will allay any fears or should allay any fears. And I think the, the, the applicant said he's been operating for six years there now. They've not had any complaints from his dog breeding business. I don't know whether that is any different to what's proposed. As I said, there are eight kennels. You won't necessarily have 16 dogs there. And I think from what James said, um, thank you, Mr. Millichup, I think uh, we can dispense with it. Yeah. From what James said on the, on the condition, nine, as I read it, the dog exercise area hereby permitted shall be used by no more than two dogs at any time. But then you said a single dog or two from the same family, which is a bit different. So is that, that's an amendment to nine. Now, a single dog being exercised or two dogs from the same family. So if you get two strange dogs, there could be more of an issue of noise whether they're being exercised. Yes, so I'll take your point, Jeff. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's an amendment to, yeah. nine, to that effect. Okay. okay. Um, and you remember we did approve a dog exercise area down at Western Hall, where you go on to the burrows at the Apple Gate. Uh, and I've seen that being used by that. But I've never seen to hear dogs yapping and barking. Usually they, they only bark and cause a nuisance if they're frightened or worried or... It, you don't normally hear them all barking. As I said, you go out to the dog's trust kennels. There's a lot of dogs out there and you never hear them all bark and yapping. So I, I think it's over, uh, over concern from residents. I accept that, that you know, that they've got valid reasons to be concerned, but I do think what's proposed is that should be acceptable and that there will not be a problem from noise from this development with the siting and the attenuation that's in place. So I'm going to move that we do approve this as per the recommendation. Will somebody second that? I'll second that. Thank you, Councillor Craig seconding that. And if nobody wants to make any further comments, we'll go to the vote. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Barrington. At four. Councillor Brown. Councillor Bushby. Four. Councillor Christie. Four. Councillor Craigie. Four. Councillor Leather. Four. Councillor McGough. Four. Councillor Pennington. Four. Seven, four, and one abstention, Chair. Thank you, Sandra. Right, we move on then now to our second application, which James is going to present on the same site. Um, and this is this is on page 30, 37 to 45 mm -hmm. of the agenda. Thanks, James. Thank you, Chair. Um, as you clarified, this is on the on the same site at West Villa and Shieldsworthy. The application reference is one slash zero nine five three slash twenty twenty two slash FUL. And the proposal is uh, change the use of land to um, super generous and um, siting of shipping container to how pet crematorium. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, this is the um, site location plan shown edged in red. It's currently a grass area which is located adjacent to the um, applicant's existing access and the existing access, uh, existing outbuildings, um, which were previously um, mentioned in poor state of repair. The applicants again ownership within the blue line um, is shown there. Um, the dwelling and their annex shown to the southern part, the existing mobile home previously permitted by plans committee, and again uh, not shown on on this particular plan to the site of that mobile home with the two recently um, constructed dwellings, uh, which were discussed on the previous application. And again, other third party dwellings we have on the opposite side of the public highway to the uh, to the northwest of the site. And also dwellings to the south east of the site. Uh, again, the main built form of Chillsworthy is to the east and the southeast. Uh, Chillsworthy is designated as a village in the local plan, um, and in planning terms, uh, the the site is located within the countryside, but well related to um, the village of Chillsworthy. Um, <clears throat> I thought for the benefit of members, it might just be worth sort of taking you through a bit about how. The crematorium would actually function really. It's, it's not an application that we, we see come before committee um, on, on a regular basis. So, uh, the, the specific model that the applicant is proposing is an ad field 
PET 2200, which is a specialist um, facility that's constructed for exactly the purposes of, of PET um, cremation. It has two chambers. Um, the first chamber is heated to uh, 1450 degrees C, and that effectively um, in, incinerates the, the carcass of the animal. Uh, there is then a second chamber which um, heats to 850 degrees C minimum, which deals with the gases from um, the, the incinerated cremated animal. Uh, the, there's also heating below that, those chambers to ensure that there's a 360 degree um, even heat uh, within, within the crematorium. And for this particular model, um, it, it can uh, handle up to seven pets per day, and it's below the 50 kilo per hour threshold um, for when an environmental permit would be required. Uh, but it is still regulated uh, separately to um, the planning system. It's regulated by the Animal and Plant Health Agency. Uh, there's three fuel options for it, you, um, which are either powered by diesel, or N gas or LPG. In this instance, the applicant's proposing to use diesel, which would be uh, a tank in one end of the shipping container and the incinerator in the other, the other end of the um, shipping container. Uh, so hopefully that's just I mean, useful for background in terms of how this the, the, the development will will work and function. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just a couple of aerial images. This uh, shows on the left the, the site at close up, and the site there is marked with the red star. And again, on the right hand side, that just shows the relationship of Chills Livy to Holes Livy. And again, the site is shown, shown with the red star. Next slide, please. Again, the existing site plan which just shows the situation on the ground. Next, next slide, please. And uh, this is the proposed site plan. So on the left hand side is the wider site. On the right, I've just blown it up a little bit so that it may hopefully be a little bit clearer. But effectively, you've got the uh, the proposed shipping container, which would house the incinerator, which is shown against the mature hedge bank, which forms the western boundary of the applicant's land. And then on the other side of that boundary is the, the public highway. Uh, also, landscaping surrounding the shipping container, um, as shown there. It's noted also that the car parking area is shown on the proposed site plan. However, it's not, it's not actually within the red line um, for the application. Uh, this means really that, that members can't consider that, that as part of the application. I know members have just resolved the grant permission for the kennels for which the um, car parking area is shown. However, there's obviously no certainty that, that that's implemented, even though we get grant permission for the kennels they may not implement that. And so there's no certainty that that parking area would definitely come forward. That issue is addressed within the um, officer's report. There is a large area close to the appellate, uh, applicant's dwelling, which would comfortably, in your officer's view, accommodate any traffic um, and parking movements that are, uh, are required as part of the development. Because really, obviously, as I said to start with, the incinerator can only handle seven pets per day. The, the applicant is proposing, obviously, that this would be an appointment only. Benefit. And so they have control really over the amount of people that are coming to the site. Um, and obviously, that is, in your officer's view, fairly um, small scale. Next slide, please. This just shows the elevations of the floor plans. Um, the footprint of the container would be six meters by 2.4 meters. Uh, the height is 2.8 meters. And uh, the top of the flue would be uh, four meters. Next slide, please. This is just details of the proposed incinerator wholly contained within the shipping container. Uh, suggested condition three actually specifies this particular incinerator. Um, and in your officer's view, that condition is necessary to ensure that the, uh, the impacts would be acceptable. Next slide, please. Uh, some photographs. This is left looking to bank across the site from the access. The right hand side shows the site again. Uh, the ship container would just be sighted to the right of the telegraph pole, which you can see there. Next slide, please. On the left hand side is the existing parking area, which is up by the um, applicant's dwelling. And on the right hand side, the existing access and, uh, and gates. And there's some uh, pictorial representations of the incinerator shown within, um, within the shipping container. Next slide, please. 
So the material considerations in this case are the principle of development, character and appearance, highways, residential amenity, biodiversity and surface water drainage. As previously, it's your officer's view that policy BM14 officers in principle support for the application um, by virtue of its uh, uh, office support for small scale economic development in the rural area, where it's well related to um, defined settlements such as Chillsworthy. Um, again, the key, key uh, consideration for members here is the impact on, on residential amenity. There have been a number of objections, as you've seen from the officer's report, which raised, do raise concerns in terms of emissions. Uh, again, we have Matt Millichope here. Um, if members do have any specific queries in that regard, um, because he's obviously the Environmental Protection Officer, uh, Matthew Millichope has confirmed that there's no objections, subject to conditions that the incinerator should be used in accordance with the manufacturer's specification. Um, and again, really the concerns of the Parish Council, the board member, and the members of the public are, are noted. Um, uh, as set out though within the officer's report, it is considered that the amenity impacts would be acceptable. And uh, and as all other matters are also considered acceptable, it is uh, recommended that the application be approved, subject to the condition is set out on page 45 of your agenda. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, James. <clears throat> right, we've uh, got speakers to this one, this application. Um, and we've got this, the parish councillor again, Councillor Horns, who's uh, going to speak on behalf of Horns with a hamlet. <clears throat> and again, you have three minutes to address yeah. the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, speaking on behalf of uh, Horsworthy Hamlet's parish council, which opposed the change of use of land and the operation of an animal crematorium at uh, West Philip. My research shows that the operation of animal crematorium is unregulated. Whatever conditions are attached to approval, the owner has already shown contempt in not complying with planning approval conditions. What is said and what will become practice will not be regulated. Who will oversee and ensure maintenance of the unit is carried out and that it will be operated in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions? There is no mention within the environmental report for the need to re recognize the carbon footprint. As a committee, you have previously approved planning for solar farms that meet government demands of clean energy and environmental concerns. Yet the planning officer is minded to accept the significant industrial carbon producing unit operating in a residential location. How can you justify this blip drop in policy? Children of the residents will be alarmed by this lack of environmental awareness. Furthermore, the prevailing wind will blow these diesel fumes across adjacent properties, noting that the committee report map is not accurate to reflect the position of 12 new homes and the outline planning approval for a further six properties where this is considered totally unattractive to any developer and will not help uh, Torridge's housing demand. While the supporting evidence of the unit's operation meets environmental standards, it is still discharging diesel combustion products that are harmful, particularly with low emissions over an extended period, and the unit has no exhaust cleaning capability. The planning environment report states there is no significant risk in the plant operation, but this also implies that there is some risk so it's not risk free. Many residents have commented on how inappropriate to be uh, breeding puppies, kenneling dogs, and disposing of loved pets within the same site. This unethical business operation is not suited to a residential location. The letters of support have no substance and appear to be from people out of the area, whereas Chillsworthy residents have written in detail their real concerns for such an operation. Furthermore, there is no mention of any employment opportunity. The research shows there are alternative animal cremation facilities within North Devon. We do not dispute that the unit is compliant, but the business operation is totally inappropriate in a village and residential setting, and strongly request that you refuse this planning application. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hoy. <clears throat> Our next speaker speaking against the application is Richard Ainsley again. I am. So this is democracy. <clears throat> we do not cite nuclear dumps near people. We do not have shooting ranges near schools. In no circumstance should a pet crematorium be situated in a quiet residential village. 
Cremation should properly take place far from where people live their lives. Contrary to what is claimed, there is no need to burn dead animals here. Mr. Godolphin in the village recently lost a dog in the field of Its cremation was arranged quickly and efficiently by local vet and Bode. This is an industrial application inappropriate to the proposed site. It also contravenes the local plan in that it should, it would not be enabled, in quotes, enabled to meet local economic and social need. The vital but often ignored matter of residential amenity is given short shrift by the Environmental Protection Officer and others. There will be emissions, smoke, and odor released far too close to our dwellings the contents of which I am not satisfied are safe. This is the latest in a series of schemes in which you appear willing to overlook the reasonable objections of those who will be affected detrimentally and directly. In the name of democracy, everyone was objecting to this, all the local people. In the name of justice, please refuse this. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, the next speaker is in support, in, and that's uh, Ben Harris. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, so uh, from our research, there's definitely a need for a pet crematorium in the area. Um, we have uh, five vet practices on site willing to use the service already, based in Holsworthy, Bude, Bradworthy, Heartland, and Torrington. There isn't currently a pet cremation service in Torridge at all. Our main customers should be directly from the vets, so it shouldn't be too many traffic movements in and out. Um, Breeding dogs and pet cremation actually go side by side, uh, potentially dealing with the same customers under different circumstances. And all over the country, there are quite a few kennels that have their own crematorium. So we know that the businesses go hand in hand. This is a DEFRA approved system with minor emissions. It's placed inside the shipping container for easy movement and relocation if, if needs be. It won't be visible from anywhere other than on our own property. Um, we've done lots and lots of research and spoken to many animal businesses in the area, and they all feel that there is actually a need for this service in the area, um, as seen in the amount of support comments, um, which we've had from vets, uh, pet shops, and other various animal businesses. It's certainly a sustainable business because animals need to be disposed of on a regular basis. Um, and the thing is, with, with West Villa, it's not viable to run simply as an agricultural holding because there isn't enough land there. Um, and we feel that it is a necessary proposal for the countryside, and it's a very viable proposition. And villages need an economical driver, and it's not available anywhere else in Torridge. Thank you. Thank you. And... Yeah, Councillor Heffel speaking to this as the board member. Thank you, Chair. Um, this will be much briefer. Um, obviously, the main substance of my argument against this one, to a large extent, um, is the same as before. I, I, I still maintain this is a village location. It's not in the countryside. It may be classified as in the countryside in planning terms, but this is a village location. Uh, however, the proposal to site an animal crematorium in a village location is totally unacceptable, and as far as I'm aware, unprecedented in the UK. Human and animal crematoria are, with obvious good reason, always sited sensitively, discreetly, and away from residential areas, villages, and the like. The planning process here in the UK performs many functions, but one of the primary functions is to ensure that inappropriate development does not take place. And this, in my view, is a prime example of just that. Without a shadow of doubt, this, if this development is permitted, it will cause significant harm to the amenities of neighbouring properties and consequently would be contrary to North Devon and Tory local plan policy DM01. 
the case officer states in his report that, quote, the application successfully demonstrates that the impact would not be significant. Closing out of comments. I wholeheartedly disagree with the statement and can see nothing in the report that demonstrates this. Surely citing a crematorium, animal or human, in a village location will cause stress, anxiety, and significant harm to the amenities of neighboring properties. And to not appreciate this displays a lack of sensitivity and understanding that, quite frankly, beggars belief. I ask that this is refuted. Thank you, Councillor Hepburn. <coughs> right, that's the uh, last speaker on this application. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think it was James earlier. I don't know whether I misheard him, but when he's talking about the uh, the actual um, shipping container that the incinerator is going to be situated inside. Did I hear you right saying the fuel tank is also going to be in with the incinerator? Yes, that's correct. And, and that's, yeah. that's yeah. deemed safe to do that, presumably. Yes, it is. I mean, there, there's obviously other legislation that covers um, the storage of hazardous yeah. materials as well. Thank you. Um, the only other point is, is merely an observation, really. I mean, much has been said about the siting of the crematorium. Um, but I'm sure we're all aware of the North Devon crematorium where nowadays we all seem to visit that more and more often. Um, and that's surrounded by residential development. In fact, there's a brand new development which has gone in immediately beside it and there's over 200 houses in there. So, you know, they're not always out in the countryside. Thank you, Councillor Bushby. Councillor Christine. Uh, yeah, the um, I've just been checking actually. The only other one in North Devon is actually on a farm uh, near Sherwell. It's not near anywhere, but um, can I ask one thing? I, I've been chairman of Crematorium, and it's a slightly technical point, but we had to spend half a million quid on putting in equipment to remove mercury from teeth. Um, pets today all have microchips in. Has that has that been allowed for in this inside a Container. That's a very technical it is a very technical question. I don't know whether. Um, no, it's not, it's, not, it's not something we would know, I'm afraid, in terms of the microchip side of things. Uh, I was going to ask the other question about the cremulator, but perhaps I better not ask that. <laughs> They've got a cremulator, do you know? You have? Yeah. Right. Thank you. Councillor okay, Pennington. I would like to ask, what is the definition of a pet? And the reason I'm asking is that there's more and more small gardens that have got a few chicken that are classed as pets. The avian flu has been decimating a lot of the countryside and the business owners. Is there any risks of something being classed as a pet being brought to this area and spreading disease around the other areas? I th it's a very good question, actually, Councillor. So I, th I think in terms of avian flu, there's obviously a number of measures that are in place through DEFRA to, con to control and manage that outbreak. And so uh, and, and so the applicants would obviously have to abide with that separate legislation as well as, as, well as planning legislation. So there is no definition then between what is classed as an agricultural animal and a pet. So you could, somebody could bring in their pet cow. They could. I, I suppose so. I mean, in, the, in this instance, uh, the, the size and the scale of the incinerator would preclude um, a cow, for example, being cremated. But but I, I take your point, really. Where does the line? Where is the line drawn between a pet and an agricultural animal? Yeah. Where is the, is that a pet or is that an agricultural animal? I think if it was if it was kept for the on a residential basis, really for the enjoyment of a family, then it would qualify as a pet. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, <clears throat> looking at the specification for the PET 200, uh, the door aperture is 750 by 550. You ain't going to get a cow through that. Thing. It's not <laughs> meant for animals of a large size like that. That's obvious. And the internal dimension is 1200 by 750 by 700. So it is for dogs, cats. If you've got a pet chicken here, put a pet chicken. So in. may I follow on, Chair? I don't yes. want to get into a, a conversation with you, Chair, whatsoever. But may I follow on? Um, situation, again, comes up. 
is the risk, isn't it? Is it's going to be from the vet route, vets around the area that are going to send the animals here, or is it going to be direct from um, the pet owners themselves without any interaction with the vets and any communicable diseases that may not be picked up had it been through a vet? So is the vet involved in this process? Or is the vet not involved in the process? And they, they, it, it's both really, because I understand that the, the uh, a, a proportion of the business for the applicant is going to be through um, uh, through veterinary um, work, obviously, and that and those animals are supplied through vets. But as I understand it, there is also the ability for um, private clients to to bring their animals to um, to the facility for for cremation as well. So there is an element of biodiversity risk here. Um, I don't know if uh, no, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess again, I, I don't know the um, procedure for if your for if a pet dies, whether you do have to report that to a to a vet or anything like that, or whether there's something that covers that in terms of other legislation. I'm, I'm not sure, Councillor. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Pennington. Anybody else want to contribute to the? I asked on the site visit yesterday, and thanks to James for finding out it'll be an oil fired facility, he said. And I was expecting Chillsworth, there's quite a lot of central heating systems running on oil down there because uh, I don't think they got mains gas down there. That's correct, Chair. The applicant's dwelling is also powered by oh, that means, yeah. yeah. So um, I'm reading the description in here of the PEP 200. The rest of it that goes with it online. I'm sure you've all looked at that. Um, just talk about any emissions from it. I don't think, from what that says, there will be any problems with emissions from the chimney. There'll be some, obviously, but it's it's what what it is. That's in front. Councillor McGon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to propose we approve this application. And my grounds are what you just alluded to there. I, I don't see no concerns as whatsoever. Councillor Bush, you pointed out the crematorium in Barnsville, how close it is. It's not going to be done on a large scale. And I think to the applicants, I think best luck to you. You know, you've seen a little opening in the market, go for it. There's only way you're going to increase the business. So it's economic drive for me and rural economic drive. And it, to, I, I class this is it's rural, it's a rural part of the country. So I wish you best of luck. And you cut the middleman, i.e., vets, etc. Fantastic, because you don't want to give money to the middleman. Go straight direct. If you want to do it for private people like myself with pets, I'd, I'd love to come to you. you know, I've got the pets, so you know, there's no business transaction here. There's, no, there's nothing back with all this stuff or whatever. But you know, got direct with you. You know, fine. You know, I think best luck to you. You're not doing like seven thousand a day. I'm pretty sure bonfires in people's gardens they put a lot more rubbish on them in the rural parts and urban as well. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor McGough. <clears throat> well, I'll second that recommendation to approve it. And if everybody's finished contributing, we'll go to the vote. Councillor McGough recommended an uh, approval and I've seconded it, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Boucher. Four. Councillor Brown. Four. Councillor Bushby. Four. Councillor Christie. Four. Councillor Craigie. Four. Councillor Leather. Four. Councillor McGough. Four. Councillor Pennington. Four. That's unanimous, Chair. Right, we move on then. Agenda item eight on the is uh, on pages 46 to 57, and that is the appeal decisions. <clears throat> That's printed there if you want to note those. Item nine on the agenda is costs on appeals. There are no costs being awarded on the appeals. That's on pages 58 to 59. Item 10 on the agenda are the delegated AGMB applications. Pages 60 to 61. 
as you see this, I want three of them are re refused. Those who noted that. And on page 62 to 73 is the list of planning decisions between the 18th of November 2022 and the 3rd of January 2023. And they're on pages 62 to 73. All noted, thank you. Right, that's the answer. Sorry, I don't know. There's a quite so many refusals. Yeah. Usually there's one or two of the whole thing. Right, thank you. That concludes the meeting for today, then that's the final item on the agenda. There's no part two, so I declare the meeting closed at one half the night. Thank you, everyone. Thank everybody on the committee for your involvement. Thank you to the officers who spoke, members of the public who been listened to it, and Sandra and Presley. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you.